Yeah, my name is Gerhard Rempe. I'm director of the quantum dynamics division and I'm also a professor at the Technical University of Munich teaching quantum optics. Quantum optics is a superposition, basically, of two words. One is quantum and the other is optics. So optics, I, I guess everyone knows. Um, it has to do with the nature of light, how light propagates, uh, how light is generated, how light is absorbed. And the quantum stands for quantum mechanics. And so we are talking about the quantum nature of light, understanding the quantum properties of light, and also using the quantum properties of light for new applications, completely new applications, which are, to the best of our knowledge, impossible in the purely optical world. In classical physics, we all know that we can measure the same thing again and again. But in quantum physics, this is different. If, if, you, if you make a measurement, you perturb the system. In my lab, we have developed the art of making measurements without disturbing the system. Usually, these detectors impinge on some material system. The photon is absorbed, it disappears, and an electron is generated. And the ele electron is equivalent to a current, and you can measure the current. So this is the standard way of how to measure a photon. Now the question is, can you measure a photon without absorbing it, without destroying it? And the answer is yes. And we take an atom, we prepare a dipole in the atom, which means there's already a moving charge. Now the photon comes, is not absorbed because the atom is basically equally in a ground and excited state. So it cannot be absorbed, but it can change the phase of the dipole. Very small, very subtle effect. And now the art of the measurement is just to measure the, this phase. How do you make sure that the photon that, that comes from somewhere, that travels with the speed of light in a, in a, through an optical fiber, let's say, how do we make sure that this photon interacts with this tiny atom? The atom is really small. So if you just take a single photon and shine it on a single atom with almost 100% probability, absolutely nothing will happen. So what is the solution? Well, we can put a mirror, let's say, behind the atom. Then the photon comes, passes the atom, sees the mirror, is reflected, and has a second chance to interact with the atom. We double our probability. But if we start with a probability which is extremely small, doubling is really, really not much. So we have to repeat this experiment and put another mirror. So one mirror is in front of the, of the atom and one mirror is on the other side of the atom. And then the photon can bounce between these mirrors many, many times, 100,000, million times. And then we gain by a factor of a million. And if we start with something small and you multiply with one million, this number can be very big. And in fact, in our experiment, it's one, it's 100%. <laughs> Photon bounces, bounces back and forth, and, and, and in the end, it just bounces back. So it goes back into the optical fiber where the photon initially came from. So where does it go to? Well, it goes to a second system. And it sees the second system, it influences the second system, and is also reflected from the second system. So it, it goes to the third system. And in this way, we can take a single photon, reflect it from a couple of systems in a row, and in this way, produce what is called an entanglement. And the distance should be as large as possible, uh, from Garchen to Munich, maybe from Munich to Hanover, making, making whatever uh, in a different, into a different country. We are actually working on, on, on this kind of system, which we call a quantum internet.
<laughs> so here you can see a prototype of what uh, we call a quantum internet node. It can trap a single atom between two optical mirrors. These optical mirrors are in this experiment made of fiber, optical fibers. The defining feature worldwide, so to say, a unique feature of this experiment is that it just doesn't have one cavity, but two cavities. So, so the atom basically is, is trapped right in the middle here. All the optics, which, which one can see here, steers, laser beams, uh, right onto the atom, which is trapped in, in, in the two optical fiber resonators. Everyone talks about quantum computers these days. It's a big hype. It's a huge hype. Um, one, so why is a quantum computer interesting? Well, because it can couple many, many qubits and in this way can perform calculations with qubits which are impossible on a classical computer. And the challenge is to scale this up to more and more qubits. The Google machine, which was demonstrated about two years ago, has had 53 qubits. Fantastic. Fantastic. But 53 is not a really big number, because in the end, people talking, talk about thousands of qubits. And for error corrections, for each of these qubits, you need maybe another thousand qubits. So we are talking about a million qubits or something like this. So for the really hard problems that one would like to solve with a quantum computer, one needs an enormous number of qubits. But the question is, how, how do you bring these enormous number of qubits in one space and have the possibility that more or less every qubit talks to every other qubit? How, how would you do this? So how do classical computers function? Well, they have a core processor, maybe another one, another one, and, and they talk to each other via electric wires or electric lines, which means in the end you put some electrons into the line, charge the line at one end, and you wait, so to say, for the, for the signal which propagates uh, through, through the line. It works fantastically in the classical world, but it would not work in the quantum world, because in the quantum world, phase matters. And phase is lost in collision processes. Um, so in, in, in the quantum world, you, what you would need to do is take an electron from this one transistor, let's say, from this one part of the processing device and move the electron physically to the other processing units. Ballistically, free flight. This works over distances of micrometer, but not millimeter and not kilometer. Now, the situation is completely different with photons. Photons and optical fibers move coherently over kilometers. So building a large-scale quantum computer is possible, that's our proposal, is possible by means of uh, connecting smaller quantum processors with photons. And that's the whole idea, so to say, of, of our research then, that we have these modules uh, atoms in cavities and the photon interacts with these modules, flies somewhere else and carries the information from one system to the other in a coherent way, which cannot be done with electrons. Each of these little rods here are tiny optical fibers oh. and in the middle, in the middle of these fibers hard to see, uh, that's where the atom is supposed to be. So if you zoom in, if you zoom in and magnify everything, you come to the lower picture here. And the lower picture basically sh shows two optical resonators made of four fibers in total. And that's the crossing point, that's where the, where the atom is. And I think we, also, we, we even have an atom, atom available, which you can see here. It's a picture of an, of an atom which is illuminated with laser light. Um, the laser light is scattered by the atom, is captured by a camera. It's roughly a micrometer or so in size, which of course is much bigger than the atom is. Uh, but the optics is of course limited by the wavelengths, so, so, so we are not able to see something which is smaller than the wavelengths. Um, but, but this is how our atoms uh, basically look like, and, and it's a single atom. We know for sure it's a single atom. Because if you look at the light which is emitted by the atom, 
uh, it consists of single photons. And only a single atom can emit single photons. Atoms is one possibility to do these experiments, but one big class of particles um, which uh, has not yet been explored, basically nowhere in the world or hardly anywhere in the world, are molecules. We developed a couple of new trapping and cooling technologies to bring molecules to a standstill, to prepare molecules in a well-defined rotational vibrational state so that we can trap molecules for up to a minute and we are in a situation where we can actually bring molecules together and, and have, let them interact in a, in a pretty controlled way. With the goal, in the end, uh, to prepare molecules for experiments which so far are considered impossible. people come and apply and, and we invite them, my ambition is to find out whether these students, uh, these applicants want to change the world. Not the general world, of course, but the world in, in, in their research field. With their expertise in, in their community, they should do something which changes the world. And so far, all of them succeeded. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing.